this is Lee Court. Have you ever wondered what happens to badly disabled young people if they can't get into a cheshire home? I could they live at home, which is often lonely and purposeless, and they may feel a burden on their families? Or they're in chronic wards, which is nearly always a travesty of life, surrounded by the senile and dying. Lee Court was the first cheshire home, where in caring for a man dying of cancer, Group Captain Cheshire began what was to grow into the worldwide Rider Cheshire Mission for the Relief of Suffering. The original house was a decaying Victorian mansion, and the Carnegie Trust gave the money for this building. Mary was living at home before he came here. His family was out at work all day, and as the flat was upstairs and there was no lift, Snow used to sit at the window and watch the gasometers go up and down. Elsie doesn't always look as worried as this. Being filled at film was a nerve-wracking business. She was in a chronic ward for five years. Another girl about the same age was in the same ward, and a spastic girl who couldn't talk, so Elsie looked after her. All the other patients were elderly, and her only outlet was to spend the day in the occupational therapy department. Mind you, it was a better hospital than most. She was in a ward for eight, not thirty-eight. Joyce's toes have grown strong and flexible, and she can do amazing things with them, in spite of her spastic movements. People who've never been able to use their hands, learn to use their feet and mouths instead. Albert was given the full works at the rehabilitation department at King's College Hospital, and was taught how to be independent. With his gadgets and techniques, there are a few daily activities he can't manage. He washes and dresses and feeds himself. He does his hair with a pin fixed to an arm on his bed head. He turns his wireless iron off with a tool held in his mouth. And he earns his own living by painting with a brush held in his mouth. Almost time for breakfast. The lift is large and largely automatic, with controls at wheelchair level, so that if you can wheel yourself about, you can get up and down stairs yourself. There are 39 residents, and the noise in the dining room is sometimes past belief. The wall between the dining room and TV room and the glass doors between the dining room and library fold back, making a hall for films, pictures and parties. Perhaps the high spot of the past few years was a review the residents did a couple of years back, which ran for two and a quarter hours. It was really good. The outside help we had, the producer, musical director and stage manager, were either experienced amateurs or professionals, gave our homegrown talent polish. Dorothy has been coming and giving treatment for 12 years, and Trotty has been having it for 10, so both of them can remember the early struggles in the old house. They were exciting days. The Corbridge, something always did turn up in the most miraculous way. Shops open for half an hour twice a day, and Maggie runs it. Harry serves behind the counter. The turnover of the last year was £1,800, and 173 of that was profit. It sells the small necessities, sweets, cigarettes, stamps, writing paper, shampoos. Since we're three miles from this and seven from Petersfield, our nearest town, we need a shop. Besides, the profits go into the welfare fund. 
I will say if I'm peaceful renting our fortnight the films, keeping the two TVs and the wirelesses in each bedroom going, paying for the petrol for outings in the bus, and all the other activities run by the Residents' Welfare Committee. You can have up to a pound's worth of credit on the book. After the shop closes at 11 o'clock, there's mid-morning coffee in one of the two TV rooms. Each channel has its devotees who look on the other lot with faint disdain. Nobody's bow while Derek's around. He's from the outback of Norfolk. making a scarf for her Uncle Frank. Most people work in the morning, so whether you work or not is entirely up to you. Joy's accomplishments are many and varied. She likes Andrew's cigarettes has been known to break one in half and throw it away when she thought he'd been smoking too much. Once she picked Snow's pocket with her feet while he was absorbed in conversation. And she's the only girl in Hampshire who flirts with her feet. A girl with quick feet and a soft heart. She can't bear to see anyone cry. For a couple of months last summer, we had a young French girl here who dripped slow tears of homesickness the whole of her first day. She fed to her at supper that night, and after a few minutes, Joy was shedding tears too, of sympathy for Christian. The room that Joy shares with Elsie is the gathering place for a crowd of pop record enthusiasts. Her record players are no danger of rusting from disuse. Even like Albert, she's almost entirely independent without using her hands. But unlike him, she can use her feet as hands. Considering she threads her needle at leg length, her eyesight must be well adapted too. vitality you feel worn out just to think of it. She uses some of her energy to pack Joy's letters and take her walking for miles in the summer, but there's still enough left to set off a volcano. One of the embarrassing moments she treasures was at a fancy dress party. She and a six foot three medical student had to demonstrate courting in a caveman days. He dragged her out of the dining room door along the corridor and then at the TV room door. She showed proud bruises for days after. as Evelyn's household work. All the jobs are voluntarily done. Muriel helps in the kitchen in the morning. Doris delivers the post. Nip takes the papers round and so on. coming across the bridge to the workshop, which is separate from the house. Paul's another person who was in a chronic ward from when he was 17 till he came here at the age of 19. Actually, he doesn't often do wood turning because his main job is working as treasurer and news editor of the Cheshire magazine. He writes, too, and paints. 
A painting master takes a class once a fortnight. Whenever anybody wants a watch mending or needs first aid for a pair of shoes, they come to Laurie. His official job's workshop manager, and he orders materials, helps people, and supervises generally. They're in Laurie's cameraman of the film unit, so Paul had to shoot this. Barnes a member of the film unit as well, a sound technician and cutter. His printing headings on writing paper here. Brian recently passed his final exams to be a Methodist local preacher. No mean achievement in a house with a quiet corner to study was practically impossible to find. And he's the first of us to go abroad for a summer holiday. He and a girlfriend went to Spain last July. All the usual crafts are done in the workshop and the welfare fund buys articles as they're made and markets them so that the makers get immediate payment. They earn the selling price less the cost of materials. The goods are sold on order as a rule, and when we exhibit at shows, we sell a quantity and take more orders. Four local housewives help in the workshop, manning it every weekday morning. They have no training as occupational therapists, but this isn't really occupational therapy anyway. These voluntary helpers, and the many more, are called slaves, a term of affection. Some come once a week to do the mending, one does the ironing, several come one or two afternoons a week and help with the baths and feeding at meals, and all the myriad jobs there are in a place like this. There's also an army of slaves who come from a distance and stay. An executive at the UA who works one weekend a month washing up and laying tables. University students who work here on their vacations. A research chemist and a BBC producer who come as orderlies from time to time. A bookbinder, schoolgirls and boys, a conservative agent. Nurses, teachers, the list is endless. As well as their labour, which is invaluable, they all do normal hours of duty, they bring their personalities and interests to enrich our lives. New Court is like a tapestry compared with the homespun of most ordinary life. There's a paid permanent staff as well, of course, a warden, a secretary, and the matron, who has a catering diploma as well as her nursing qualifications. Three more state registered nurses and four women and three men who work as nursing orderlies look after our personal needs. Kitchen staff, pantry staff, cleaning staff, the maintenance engineer all play their part. And again, not only their labour is important, but in a small isolated society like Lee Court, it would be a tragedy if there were a we and a they. Nearly everybody is called by their Christian names here. Independence Unlimited is the name of an organisation started by a local factory manager. Five or six men come every Tuesday evening to the workshop and make devices to help us overcome the limits set by our physical inabilities. All the gadgets have to be built to the individual's needs because no two problems are identical. They made Albert's easel, which slides up and down as a slight pull on the cord under the palette. Albert has achieved great things with his painting. He got a scholarship from the Martin Foot Painting Artists Association and for four years worked long hours perfecting his technique. Then, the July before last, he was accepted as a member of the association. Last May, he flew to a congress of the association at Zurich and was made one of the 25 full members in the world. This means that the association pays him a good salary and has the first right to any of his pictures. There was an autumn view from Lee Court by Albert in the association's calendar this year.
We try to have at least one sort of factory artwork at any time, but it's difficult to arrange transport so far out in the country. Assembling electrical components, trimming toy roofs, and folding calibrated paper into stacks of a thousand. Quite a few people prefer artwork to crafts, but frankly it pays better. A large portion of this film shows people working, for the simple reason that it's an easy activity to show. But it shouldn't be thought that work is the most important part of our lives. Some of us work because we really enjoy it. Some because we want the money to do other things, and some because we like the company of those we work with. But as there's no necessity to work, the only rule, and that's an unwritten one, is that nobody should be late for meals, it assumes a different value from the usually accepted one that work is a good thing in itself. When your physical activities are limited, you have the opportunity to explore other sides of your potentialities. Religion is an essential element to many, though not all. About a third of us are Roman Catholic, a third Anglican, and the rest either non-conformist or nothing in particular. Miss Elena Stockford, the secretary, is leader of the Anglicans, and under her leadership, the religious life in the chapel of St. Giles has grown vigorously. Mr. Tyler, the chaplain, comes up from the village to take Holy Communion, at an evening service on Wednesdays, and a visiting bishop sometimes takes Holy Communion on Sundays. The bus goes down to the parish church, if there's no service here on Sunday mornings. Once a fortnight on Tuesday evenings, the service is taken by a Methodist, and Friday evenings there's a rotary of Anglican clergy from the surrounding villages. The other evenings, one of the congregations says Compton. The Roman Catholic congregation, too, has gone from strength to strength in the past few years. Mass is usually said three mornings a week, and rosary is said every evening at quarter to six, unless there's a visiting priest to take benediction. The two chapels worship side by side in harmony. They give spiritual comfort and peace to many who have been through torment of mind before they have accepted their disabilities and in the distress felt as helplessness increases. They help the residents to cope with the frustrations, inevitable independence on others, and the staff to cope with the demands made on them, physically and mentally. Six years ago, when there were five Cheshire homes, the Cheshire Smile was a duplicated house magazine. The editor died, and Frank Spath took it over. He'd had no experience of editing, but he'd read very widely during the 22 years he'd spent in bed at home. The standard and circulation steadily improved, till it became recognised as the official publication of the Cheshire Organisation. Now the circulation is about 7,000, and it's one of the best magazines connected with the disabled in the country. The magazine contains news of all the homes in Britain and abroad. There are now 30 British homes and 16 in seven other countries. To read the back numbers of the magazine is to trace the history of the social movement. When the magazines arrive from the printers, the gang gets together and packs them for postage. This is Peter, the chairman of the Welfare Committee. Politics have a serious place in our lives. The three members of the Welfare Committee, Chairman, Treasurer and Third Member, are elected annually. The Chairman is the spokesman for the residents to the Administration and Management Committee. This, and the duties and responsibilities of the job, make it an exhausting honour. The members also sit with three other elected residents, 
on the Residence Admissions Committee and the three outside friends on the Lee Court Association Committee. The Lee Court Association publishes a monthly newsletter and runs a car club and is starting support groups in the county. Every July there's a gigantic fete on the grass in front of the house which draws crowds from miles around. It raises between 1,700 and 1,800 pounds. Last year the fete paid for redecorating the house inside and out and the year before it paid for a new bus. The bus can carry 13 or 14 people and several folded wheelchairs. Bus outings are generally arranged by the chairman of the welfare committee, but if six or more residents want to go and travel the maintenance engineer isn't busy doing something else, we can have it for private trips. If we expect to get back late, mates will always arrange for putting to bed, and this makes long expeditions possible. Incidentally, we can go to bed at any time if we can put ourselves to bed, or the night nurse can manage us alone. People who need two to put them to bed go before 11 o'clock. Until then, another member of the staff is on late duty. Occasionally, a matron drives the bus. Most weeks, a bus load goes out once or twice. Naturally, a lot of the outings are local, to the pictures or plays in the nearest towns, shopping in Petersfield on a Friday morning, or to tea with friends. But we go much further afield, too. Last year, the more ambitious trips included Farnborough Air Show, a concert at the Festival Hall, the Royal Countess Agricultural Show, and motor racing at Goodwood. have been going steady for five years. To get married, they'll have to leave the life they've built here. The ideal arrangement would be to have bungalows on the grounds, so that when people married, they could still take part in the community and use its special facilities. In the spring, two bungalows are to be started, but the couples with one partner disabled and the other able to earn a living. There's a crying need for these houses too, because so many marriages break up under the strain if husband or wife becomes disabled. Edith and Les are a couple who didn't break up. Edith had to leave home eventually, and Les comes down from Hertfordshire every weekend and stays. She was a model before their marriage, and they have two sons. It sounds absurd that someone utterly paralyzed and unable to speak like Edith can still make a contribution by her mere presence, but it is so. Last year, Peter organized a holidays for the disabled week at a holiday camp at Weymouth. Twenty residents went, and as many helpers, and about twice the number from outside. It was such a success that a committee had taken over the venture and hoped to make it an annual event. They could have filled the 200 beds in the camp three times over, for the week this year. It's difficult to explain what gives Lee Court its strangely fascinating quality, what brings people back again and again. It's open, thoughtful, warm-hearted, indifferent, friendly, unpredictable, ordered, chaotic, tolerant, adventurous, funny, sad, alive. Even when you're most distracted by the pressure of being constantly at close quarters with such a diverse collection of human beings, you know at the back of your mind you wouldn't want to be anywhere else. Many people are convinced that the life of the disabled must be dull and empty a burden to themselves and society. Lead court is living proof that this need not be so.